Um, now, the, the, the whole purpose of, of this engineering uh, uh, book, uh, what, what drew me to this uh, particularly, it's more challenging than the shiny uh, uh, book itself, and it gets you more into the uh, underlying uh, intricacies of how shiny actually links with our studio. And that's what really kind of drew me. I'm, I'm excited to, to uh, test out uh, the, or challenge, I guess, challenge myself to this uh, material. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, I, I, I quite, I did, I did quite like the idea of the book. I, I but to me, that um, I, I, I kind of read through half of it, and and halfway through the the Master in Shiny book, uh, book club, we had an interview with um, Colin Fay. Um, he like he joined us. For, oh, sorry, I'm trying to find, trying to find my notes for the book. Club. Right. Um. Yeah. He. He joined us and, and we kind of had an interview where we were kind of explaining that we were planning on doing his book subsequently. And he was he was really he was quite a, quite interesting interview, really. Um, the, there are things in it in this in the engineering book. Sorry, there are things that to me seem like a typical part of a production app, things like security and kind of um user validation type things and um you know s simple things like you know database reason rights and things right that I, I i don't think really get covered in this book and and they were things that i thought would be at, you know would be within the remit of this engineering right uh book but um nonetheless there's interesting stuff in there and um so yeah. i've got a um i've got some notes on the um thing hopefully you can see my uh computer screen sure is that, can is that working right okay cool um yeah. yes uh so i've got um I've got some notes on the book, but obviously the book's more extensive than anything I'd write. Um, so uh, I might as well go through them and we'll just have a discussion as we go through, uh, if that's OK with you both. Um, I don't know whether anyone might join us during the, the thing. But, um, OK, so I included some stuff from the introduction as well. Um, because there's there's some interesting kind of motivational stuff in there. Um, so um, the authors describe that there's you know there's there's good content out there to to explain how to build your build your first shiny app. And you know since this since this book's been written, th there seems to have been like a you know a, a torrent of of like blog post showing you how to to write your your first shiny app so that isn't where this is pitched um it's more at the end of kind of you have a shiny app um it is a value to someone be it your you know colleagues or be it a, a, a customer or something like that and um you want to be able to ensure that that uh, app can continues to be of value to those people you may need to introduce new features you may need to introduce you know not introduce bugs you may need to fix bugs and things like that you know during the 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 the, the lifetime of that app but um yeah so but and and the kind of the framework described in some of the software engineering um, approaches described in the book are, are, are quite valuable in helping ensure that your app lives on for the future and, and, and also that, that it's um, something that people will enjoy working with. Um, so, yes, so uh, for this week, uh, the learning objectives are, are basically an, not so much an intro to Shiny because it, it, it's a kind of pre you know, presupposed that people who are reading this book will already have written some shiny. Um, the the chapter talks about 
the different forms of complexity that um, can impact on your uh, application and how uh, the complexity of an application can be viewed differently by users and by the developers working on it. Um, uh, so hopefully I'll be able to talk about some of that kind of stuff. Right, so um, yeah, so we've already talked about the kind of motivation for, for doing this book as part of a book club. Um, the, the, there are a few, uh, you know, things in its favor. The, there was another shiny book that I'm quite interested in. And certainly when this is finished, I might look to do a, a, a further book club on, which was something it, more a kind of uh, front end focused book uh, called um, Outstanding User Interfaces for Shiny or something, something along them lines, it was written by someone called David Groundshaw. Um, to be honest, I don't feel confident enough at the moment to 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 study that book in depth, but uh, it is something that I'm looking to do in the future. But this book, it, um, it, it was just very popular amongst the Alpha Data Science um, book club requests channel. So it was, you know, it was a good idea to get it done uh, early. Now, um, within the book club, um, a, a lot of the chapters are relatively short. Um, and there's relatively few things like, you know, exercises and stuff like that. So I figured we could probably do, uh, you know, two chapters a week, typically. Um, and I've put up a, um, a timetable for, you know, what will be covered when, um, but it's yet to be merged into the, the, the repo for, for, for this, um, book club but anyway um so the motivation is just that it's an interesting shiny book that was popular amongst the alpha data science um community and we're just going to work through it in the same way that we work through mastering shiny um so the audience um according to the the preliminaries would be relatively experienced shiny developers and also those people who are kind of managing the uh, you know, overseeing the development of, of shiny apps, and there's a there was a bit of a, a, a discussion on to as, as to what production means for people, and um, R as a whole, there's a kind of there's been an ongoing um, um, thread amongst the Python community uh, that goes somewhere along the lines of R is not ready for production along various different lines and um, as someone who was kind of a research scientist until a year ago um, production never really was something I'd considered something that you know that I was uh, working towards um, so, so according to the authors the, the 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 key aspects of what production is is that your app is being used by someone there may be uh, people relying upon it for their day-to-day -day work or for you know the you know personal interest or whatever, and that it has real-life impact. In that, if your app breaks or something like that, it will impact upon either your um, life or the users of it, of, of that. App, you know. So if you know if if you're using an app that you know feeds someone's uh you know keeps them abreast of um i don't know um this, <laughs> sorry i'm trying to think of an example but there's many many no, like like no the covid pandemic is, oh, is yeah, an example yeah. of, of being able to ingest data and and be able to manipulate right zoom in yeah, zoom out yeah. kind of geospatial type data yeah um, yes, so these are the, the, there are apps built upon Shiny that are being used by you know health professionals, by politicians and whatnot to guide their decisions. Um, you know, at present, so it, it's not outlandish that R and Shiny should be used in production. I guess, um, yeah. So something that has real life impact that is used and that is relied upon. Um, 
yes, this uh, this is just the briefest introduction to Shiny. It's it's a a, a kind of an R framework for building web apps, and with it, it's relatively straightforward to build a working kind of proof of concept type app without needing to know a lot of the front end and in many ways a lot of the the, the back end complexities that things like you know the the, the web frameworks in other languages might require um, and certainly you can build something perfectly workable without much html or css or javascript training um, but yeah, uh, a, a kind of thread through this chapter was, um, you know, a, sh a shiny app doesn't necessarily need to always be a proof of concept thing. They can um, span, you know, thousands of lines of code and have hundreds of users or thousands of users or whatever. Um, so these don't necessarily have to be small scope um, applications. Um, but again, to emphasize again, sh th this book is not going to be an, a, an introduction to writing your first app in Shiny. Um, so they, they, they have a kind of section in here as to, to discuss what complexity is and how that can influence um, the future development of your application how it can influence how your users um, interact with your application um, and basically what complexity is really um, this was I, I don't know i mean I, I found this quite an interesting section really um, certainly uh, you can you can start with a simple app and add more and more code into it more and more features and things like that and ultimately you'll end up with if sorry, if you do that in a kind of unstructured way, you can end up with something that's quite where it hits a point where it's difficult to add new features in or to find the cause of a bug or things like that. From a user's perspective, the complexity with within an app um, is, you know, if if it isn't straightforward, if it doesn't imply how to use the app if it's difficult for a user to use that app then you know it's 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 uh, um, a, a problem of complexity from their perspective um i really i i don't know i'm not i'm not an expert uh, on a user experience from but yeah I've, I've kind of spent the past few months working as a shiny developer uh, for a for like a consultancy firm in in the UK and um, yeah there's uh, it uh, you you do occasionally receive an app that it it's quite hard to follow you know what should happen when you click this button um, and and things like that um, I was thinking scaling as well right so yeah, so yeah. you you build your you build your app for in-house you're you're using it to you know model or test kind of some theories and mm. then you find this application where you go into that production of hey i'm going to share this with the world right so yeah. um, being able to scale that with the amount of users that may be interacting with the uh, application itself uh, how they're um, testing or modeling on their own right it's 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 finding that special uh, path Right, threading the needle that that you're you're fitting the needs of the users that will be using the app. Um, yeah, yeah. The complexity uh, as a as a term, um, I'm using vocabulary. Complexity is how many how many different connection points does your app have? Right, how many mm. different uh, storehouses where will you be using? Um, where is the data going to be ingesting from, right? What does the pipeline look like to get it to the Shiny app? Yeah. Uh, ultimately, your, your Shiny or the web server end of it is the uh, nice and look and feel of everything, but there's a huge amount of infrastructure that's being built around just to support that one single app. Yeah. yeah. I, maybe that's a, that's a way I'm, I'm no, interpreting. No, I, I totally this agree. I, and certainly, yeah, yeah I, it did seem that, like the, there was a lot of emphasis on um, complexity in terms of um, 
you know, the lines of code or the structure of the code and, and you know, in terms of how many developers might be working on something in, 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 in this chapter. But it seemed that there was less emphasis on the, the that kind of, you know, the um, um, interfacing between the app and the kind of maybe the whatever backend code creates the data that's used within the app or um, the databases that it touches or APIs or whatever. Um, yes, but yeah, it is a, to a very important kind of source of um, complexity. Um, you know, if, <laughs> if you're touching 10 different um, URLs to bring data into your app and one of them fails, it's a much more complicated system than if you've only got the one um, store that you're depending upon. Um, anyway, uh, let's move on. So yes, so there was a bit in here about uh, the the types of complexity that you might. Oh, I guess I've just covered a bit of this. So the the thing at the bottom there, interface complexity, was about. Um, how the user, how the customer may interact with an app. And the developer complexity is those things that relate to, you know, that, that may make it more difficult to develop upon the source code or to um, deploy it for, for, you know, deploy a release of the app for, for use by the wider world. Um, there was, oh yes, I, I found this quite interesting. Le last year I was supposed to do a talk about um, various forms of code complexity. So I, I'd used a couple of these tools before. Um, Clock, which was mentioned, which uh, counts the lines of code in a um, package or in a, um, you know, R project or something like that, um, is is quite a neat system. So um well i don't know it, it, it seems to do it, it does come some pretty uh straightforward stuff let's just pull over um our studio for a second if that's okay so um these are various uh github projects of mine this here dupree is a package that i released a year or two ago um so if you is that right So this tells you, so there's a package called clock. If I pull, um, there, um, which is, it's available on GitHub, but not from CRAN as far as I'm aware at the moment. Um, and basically it counts the number of um so for this particular package it's gone through and counted all the within all the source code files that are, are um how many files there were um what number of what you know how many lines of code there are in that in those r files how many of those are blank and what's the percentage of blank lines as a you know, relative to the um, lines of code and how many comments there are. Um, so this is one form of complexity. Presumably the, 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 the inference being, you know, if you've got a project with 10,000 lines of code versus a project with a thousand lines of code, that one with 10,000 lines of code is kind of assumed to be more complex than the one that is a thousand lines of code, but it's never really that simple um, because, you know, the um, um, different teams have different ways of working and, you know, people's code can look quite different. Um, so there were examples in the book um, of comparing 
uh, a kind of tidy verse pipeline type approach. Well, I'll let's see if I can pull that example out. Um, so it was. Yes, so um, this is a three line version of, of a piece of code versus a one line piece of code uh, for the same that, that achieves the same goal. So you start with a data frame, you group it according to some um, factor within there and then summarize some numeric value within there uh, over the groups. You can write that three line piece of code in a single line, but it may be, you know, some people might find that more terse, more difficult to grasp what's going on because you have to kind of read it in reverse. Whereas the kind of tidyverse equivalent, the piped version of the equivalent might be more, um, despite being longer, might be favored by people who are used to seeing that. Um, similarly, <laughs> yeah, this is a kind of a bit of a, um, I don't know whether this is a kind of joke example because I can't imagine many people writing uh, a subsetting um, operation over five lines like this. Um, but it's basically um, this little section is to explain that you can, you can view lines of code as a source of complexity, but it isn't so clear cut. So one project might have three times as many lines of code than another, but um, it may use a, you know, if a new developer joins that project and is um, comfortable with the, um, you know, the, the programming, I don't know what you'd say, paradigm. The, paradigm, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, it may be an easier project for them to join than one where the code is more dense, but in a, you know, a, a, uh, a style that they're not used to. One of the things that I, I oh God, one of the things that really bugs me though is inconsistency of, 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 of these kinds of styles. So I added these things in myself, uh, the, the other sources of, of, of complexity. Um, inconsistency. So like, although there's two equivalent ways of doing this, if you choose to use one, you should maybe try to use that one approach throughout your code base so that it's easier to find where you're, you know, duplicating the same structures and things like that. Um, anyway, it's just the, 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 the kind of mental overhead of jumping from one style of writing code to another is always a bit of a difficult. Um, so lines of code as a source of complexity. Similarly, you can use the number of files. And, and again, this is something that clock can calculate for you. Um, and um, oh, yeah, and cyclomatic complexity. This is something this is more to do with um, the structure of an um, say if you've got a function defined within your uh, project and there's lots of if then else type logic within there um what cyclomatic complexity gives you a, a, an idea of is how many different routes there are through that function um and it's quite it's 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 something that's used in more i don't know it it always seemed a very odd thing in r because a lot of the a lot of the logical branches in an r function sorry if if you've got a vectorized function that's working on you know a, that can work on multiple rows of a data frame at at one go you might be hitting every different logical branch within a function 
in one go without having an if or else or whatever structure within that thing so i, I don't know I, I, maybe that doesn't explain it particularly well but yeah i've always found when, this a very odd sorry after you, after you no i was i was gonna i was gonna add a piece to this cyclomatic complexity so when you're in an early stage of development or an early stage of just your career right just mm. as a computer science or, or data science any any sort of uh processing of code kind of nature the undertone is if it works just use it right mm. and, and i've always been in conflict with that comment yes you're right if it works go ahead and use it but it's a really ugly source of of you know trying to manipulate or change when you become more eloquent or or more mature in your coding base yeah. then you can start using recursion and and other means of like the the example that you had before where you've got three lines of of text uh using the tidy method uh, of piping versus one single line of 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 uh, uh entry as far as the team and their and their methodologies the paradigm of of authoring um, the thing that comes to mind with that is uh, the sheer volume of different scripting languages that are out there and shiny being one of the methods that that primarily use our studio if we extend that into other services other applications other other points that may be uh, interacting so like your web server itself and then all of a sudden you you pop in uh, to generate or, or or interact with the shiny portion of your web server uh, you know there's there's more to it than just the shiny app as a standalone service you mm. may have an entire wrapping of a, of a, a web service around the yeah, entire yeah. concept your, your your packaging may get very very complex yeah, so, yeah. or the tools that you may use yeah. the other comment i was going to make and i didn't mean to interrupt uh, no, no, earlier was, when you were when you were fine. talking yeah, yeah. So one of the, the the entries i had in in a project different cohort uh different group all together they were using a it, it wasn't a compression algorithm, but they were using uh, 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 JavaScript, obviously, but then they would run it through this, this uh, engine that would remove all white space. Well, the, the, uh, the, uh, the document object model didn't really care. Uh, white space mm. is irrelevant. You just look at the characters itself. Um, but when the human would open up that file and it would just be, you know, 10,000 lines across a yeah, row, yeah. you know, and just, it, it just looks like a big block of text you would have to decompile it or de, de mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you can't optimize exactly, it, like, but grep through yeah. it when everything's no. in a single line. The, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good yeah. comment. So yeah, so so if you use the grep statement, um, if dependent on the style or the uh, method of authoring, if you go to grep something, um, is it going to pull up a whole huge block of text because it's all on one line or is it uh, very specific? Are you going to find the one entry that you need? Um, I guess ease of access or ease of ease of sifting through it. Good statement, though. Yeah, yeah, cool. This uh, cyclomatic complexity is it, it, it's quite an interesting thing. I. Um, until quite recently, I, I still contribute to it a little bit, but I, I was um, one of the developers on that, that contributed to Lintar, which is like a kind of um, uh, something for for kind of imposing a, a, a coding style on a R package. Correct. Yeah, and um, and we had a we had a Linter that would run on people's code and calculate cyclomatic complexity, and then like. Um, you know, if it for a given function, if it's over thirty, throw up a warning and whatnot. And um, we, we, we last year we made a bit of an effort to try and get Lintar to pass the linters that it defined. <laughs> and at no, at no point have we been able to get the cyclomatic complexity of the functions in there down sufficiently low that. Um, it can pass its own default linting things. Yeah, as I say, it's, so, it's checking on itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I think there is there is a, an important issue with with respect to cyclomatic complexity is that if you do use measures like this to um, to ensure that each of your functions is you know, doing a handful of statements and there's not 
many different routes through each function. So each function viewed on its own is uh, a relatively simple computational unit. To achieve, the, suppose you start with one big function and you split it out into lots of small little functions that um, each have this low complexity. Um, you still you still end up with um, you st you still end up with your your project as a whole still has the same amount of complexity. It's just that what was a single function has now been split out into lots of little functions, and now you if if you need to you know if if something breaks and you need to test or debug, debug or something like that, you now have to think about each of those little functions rather than that one big function that you... So there is a kind of double-edged sword to reducing the, the, the complexity of your, your functions. Um, what I mentioned... I mentioned this on another, another uh, uh, presentation, but uh, yeah. in, in, web, in web frameworks, the, you want to optimize the exchange between client and server so that dependent on the methodology or the uh, communications framework that the client is using, if it's Wi-Fi, if it's cellular, if it's you know, uh, some mm -hmm. other bandwidth uh, a form, DSL or, or, or yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. uh, dial-up you know, uh, a phone modem. But the, you want to optimize the exchange between client and server to the point where uh, who's going to be doing more of the work? Right. I view that on the server's side of Shiny, the the web server is doing most of the heavy lifting mm -hmm. and presenting the output. It's looking for calls from the, the client, the laptop, the user that's interacting with it uh, to manipulate that data. When we yeah, there's a there's a section in the beginning of the sh the, the, the Shiny app book where they talk about um, reactive code and optimizing so that you're not uh, constantly pulling from the from the data set that you're 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 accessing mm -hmm. uh, yeah. make it reactive so that it's kind of almost in cached media uh, that both the client and server are able to process it faster yeah. um, the the whole point I guess of the the topic of this uh, chapter with complexity is the fact that you want to minimize the the threading or the the exchange between client and server to optimize the speed and efficiency of the web application. Yeah. Um, there's a school of thought that says if a user is interacting with your web app and if it doesn't refresh in, in two seconds, you've already lost the attention of the user. Mm. And so yeah. uh, when you're asking for you know a, a change of a data set, right? We're changing the plot and it has to go out and, and process for another <laughs> you know two minutes of time. Well, I'm gonna go grab a cup of coffee and wait, yeah, you know, yeah. kind of process. Or, or a frustration, a frustration yeah. comes in into mind. Yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah, no, I, no, I, un I understand that. It's, to be honest, it's not something that I, I, I worry about all too much um, when working on Shiny. But yeah, it's certainly something. That, that, I mean, there are there does seem to be some good tools for um, determining, you know, optimizing. Um, shiny code and and towards the end of mastering shiny there's there's a couple of chapters on that um but yeah um the problem with you know if you're optimizing for one thing you may end up with code that's more complicated to maintain and, and things um but anyway there's always a trade-off of everything isn't there um so these are other forms of complexity that i deal with on a um uh uh, weekly basis. The, the 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 indentation one I found quite funny. I, I was reading this book, um, Software Design X Rays, uh, a couple a year or so ago, and it um, in it he they they describe a way to use the like the Git history of a, a project as a way to identify areas of a of a project that need to be refactored. So, for example, if when introducing a feature, one developer touches three or four different files, perhaps, uh, and, and that happens more and more often, perhaps those three or four files could be reconfigured such that um, 
were they to introduce the same feature again, it would only require them to touch a single file. So you're bringing together aspects of a project that change together. Um, indentation is, it, and it, sorry, I went off on a tangent, but indentation was one of the sources of complexity that they used in, it, sorry, a metric of complexity that they used in that book to identify um, if if you've indented your code four steps, um, then it's more comp it's a more complicated function than if everything's at the you know first level of indentation. Um, as a, it just seemed a strange thing at the time. Um, yes, other things that can cause problems: uh, a lack of tests, too many dependencies, and um, sorry maintenance and use uh, the the authors of the book were, were talking about um how well maintained and frequently downloaded packages tend to be um you know tend to um be if, if you're choosing between two packages in r and one is more frequently maintained and you know has better kind of user numbers than another then it might be a better bet to choose that first one um this is sorry this is from my real life um a, a, a measure of complexity being the number of headaches it causes the uh, um <laughs> developers on a weekly basis um i think we talked about external dependencies and and kind of number of contributors but um so not the number of contributors um so this is um a lot of i imagine there's i imagine there are some big teams working on a single shiny app but i've yet to 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 to, to experience that in my experience there's usually like a couple of people working on a, a, a given shiny app even relatively large ones um and as the number of contributors increases you have to deal with the com the, the kind of interpersonal complexity of um you know who will be working on which issue when you're working on one thing are you likely to step on the toes of another developer or anything um so these are all the kind of more that were so the number of contributors is a kind of social ideal of the complexity of an app um yeah and then i think there's a there's a nice little section to kind of round off the chapter about um what constitutes a successful shiny app so um these four things uh simply that it has been made and exists in the world presumably deployed on some server and uh, in use by customers or, or colleagues or whatever. Um, it does what it's supposed to do correctly. Um, and the immortality thing is uh, about, you know, is it, is it sufficiently well engineered that in a year, in a couple of years time, it will still be running? Um, given that there will have to be main maintenance within the, that time and and whatnot so um how can you ensure that your app is robust for the future um uh, is, is is something that we're hopefully will cover in this book um yeah so that's the first chapter in the kind of introductory sections of the uh, book there's um, a couple of applications that are discussed throughout the chapters of the book as well. So, um, one app called Hexmake, which is for kind of making the hexagonal stickers for um, R packages. Um, something related to the uh, Tidy Tuesday um, data sets. And oh, this is what you were talking about, isn't it? Minifying um javascript yeah that's it yep yep yeah. um yes uh so but it, i don't know i mean it look it, it it sets itself up to be quite a useful 
book. Um, it, I don't, I don't know whether it's been published yet. I did have a look on like Amazon a few weeks ago, and it it seems to have been I delayed a month. And, yeah, um, I uh, I've been trying to get paper based books uh, for highlighting and and taking my yeah, own notes, yeah, etc. Yeah. But the uh, yeah, this one I I didn't see seem to find it readily available instantaneously. Yeah, yeah. But, no, I, I, I did want to to at least give you a, a, a baseline of Frederica is in, in our R4DS uh, book club on Saturdays. And uh, so yeah. she's going to be uh, part as well. But um, I do have my own web server or, or RStudio uh, uh, web framework and, and, and a shiny server. And what I have found with using it thus far in these few entry weeks of, of these book clubs starting up, there's a big difference between your desktop RStudio IDE versus the uh, web server side of it and, and balancing that, that change between the two of them. The codes will work uh, identically, but it's how you interact with it. So there is a difference between the two. And what I'm really questing for to join this book club and to also join uh, the other book clubs, how do I migrate my existing RStudio Shiny app on the web framework of RStudio and then migrate it to the other end of the Shiny app side? So it's, it's two servers, right? It's, 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 it's ones for Shiny, ones for RStudio. How do you easily migrate code from one base to the other? Currently, I'm just doing a you know, CP command from, from the, a recursive CP command from one directory over to the uh, web framework shiny side to populate those, those directories. I'm hoping, crossing my fingers, planning that somewhere between the mastering shiny book and this engineering level, that there would be a, hey, there's a really easy package to do this, or at least that's my intent, so... Okay. That that okay. would be very interesting to to know because yes. I as well I know how to um, uh, load the uh, shiny app in in shiny.io website so have it there and then maybe uh, just share the link into my website to have the app in there but transfer the app into another server. I don't know how really how to do it. Maybe there would be some guidelines to follow. Um, I haven't done it yet. Kind of a sysadmin sort of, you know, process, not so much DevOps, but more like sysadmin. Like I have this application, I have this web server. What do I need to do, you know, to possibly script or, or what packages are available to me to make this job easy? That's really what I'm, I'm trying to, to uh, uh, saturate or, or Again, I, I mentioned challenging myself. That's actually what I'm I'm working through right now. So, right. okay, cool. Yeah, uh, I, I, no, I'm, yep. Sorry, no, Frederica, please. I say this the this book is very mm, looks very interesting. Um, obviously, uh, that would be uh, more practice needed to uh, get through it. Uh, it's quite advanced. But to have an idea of what are the complexities of the uh, building and shiny up, it's um, it, it's very interesting because um, I don't know if you Russ have seen had the chance to see the the um, the video that I've shared on on Slack about the production for. Uh, oh no! I didn't get a chance to to watch it. No. Um, I just to I've I've been through it just um uh, but the the few things uh, that mm, grabbed me my uh, attention were uh, about the the differences um, yeah. in making an app and then uh, running the app within a production uh, environment. So it's quite mm. uh, different and difficult to uh, have a, um, an app that runs correctly uh, within production and th this uh, has made me thinking uh, about it to be honest yeah, because yeah. when you I was thinking uh, when you make an app the, the app is just need to be run correctly isn't it so yeah. then within the production what does it happen yeah you know, one of the first things that comes to mind, Frederica, when you when you made that statement of production. So 
uh, different web browsers, right? So, so the actual document object model itself and how it's interpreting HTML, JavaScript, and, and any other vector graphics or any, any other things that Shiny may produce, right? Or, or the, the protocol translation between the RStudio IDE and then actually, you know, knitting it and, and, and publishing it to the, to the web or, or building it, uploading it to the Shiny IO. Even different browsers, I've had some users come back and say, well, your app doesn't work. Well, what browser are you using? Oh, I've got Internet Explorer. Well, what version of Internet Explorer, right? So you get into this, this level of configuration, right? So please use Chrome, please use Safari, please use you know <laughs> Firefox. I, 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 I always have to just scratch my head sometimes when Internet Explorer Edge comes into the conversation where uh, just follow the protocol, right? And, and, and not create this uh, other sort of buggery of, of <laughs> issues going on. So just a thought. Yeah. It's, but it's it's because it, I've I mean I've worked for universities and like in in in, in like um, kind of cancer science type departments. So you were a busing with medical, and a lot of the NHS over here, uh, their computers use um, browsers that are, <laughs> are in, <laughs> not quite. Um, not quite ready for shiny at the moment but um yeah it's a uh... yeah the, the shiny apps are they they they're quite useful in different uh section uh, i mean you can um apply uh, you can use uh, and you can make a shiny app and uh, uh um put it in production within uh, the nhs uh, um uh, if they need it uh, somehow, um, may, may, maybe this, Sorry, this, just this... <laughs> as an example. But I know that there are a lot of like larger um, um, enterprises and things like that where uh -huh. IT has a kind of um, has an influence that makes it restrictive what you can d develop and what you can do. That even if that might have be beneficial you know because there's you know i mean some places you might not even have sufficient access to install python or something you know um but anyway um sorry well, uh, maybe you, maybe you make an app that it's not it's not very useful so it's yeah, just like yeah. a, uh for educational purposes yeah yeah. So uh, maybe even this involves with production uh, the the utility of the yeah. app yes yeah. Cool. Um, yes. So, um, so I, I, I ought to wrap it up, really. Um, so we've done the first chapter. Um, next week, I'd like to be able to do the chapters two and three, which are about um, kind of planning for the, you know, planning how your app will develop over the over time and on kind of the basics of structuring a, a project for um, um you know structuring an app um because they then neatly tied together and then try to do the 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 first golem chapters in two weeks time um i we i mean i've i've yet to get anyone to volunteer but it definitely if anyone wants to well, um uh... pick I was going to try this if you don't mind. If I, I can do chapters two and three and, okay, and yeah, cool. have a presentation, the uh, the GitHub uh, site that uh, uh, yourself and John had pointed at. Um, do you want me to contribute the code to that base? Because if we don't have any presentation media for this book yet, um, I'm guessing this is the first cohort of, of yeah, yeah, yeah. actually compiling media. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. I can definitely. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I've 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 put my notes together. I've uh, and I've, I've okay. pushed. A something up to okay um github i will uh that but that was just the kind of timetable and things and that's yet to be merged um i'll push right. up my um book down sections today as well um okay but yeah i mean by all means contribute and, and kind of add a second chapter right. to the book as well i i have a question about uh, uh book down so if mm. I, I it it is very important to me for uh, to do the fork thing mm. uh, in github to to make the the notes yeah yeah it's it i need to do that have you been able to it, sorry yeah 
No, because I um, I did it, but it it, it, um, it just downloaded everything. Uh, so now it's for for this book club. We just have uh, been we just started, so there's nothing uh, um, to to download. But yeah. when when usually when I, I download, uh, I get I fork a, a repository. I download everything. Um, I wish do not do that. So I'm just asking that it might be a way to just uh, uh, do these things like in a lighter way, not having everything inside. Because I the, there is a way that you could. I mean, you can you can edit files directly on GitHub. Um. So if hold on, if I sh um hold on, uh, if I share this again um so if we go into um into where were we um alpha ds there um so you can directly edit things here and that will make it will it will make you a branch with under your username and from that you'll be able to make a pull request into right. the alpha data science thing okay, yes. um and and similarly you can um i think you can add yeah you can add a new file okay. as well yeah. uh directly on github i i for because it's a book down thing i tend not to do that uh for for this but if it's just you know, if I'm just editing who's mm -hmm. talking on what week and, and things like that in the meeting schedule, I might edit directly on here. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. for the book down I, I thing, it's thinking... good to know that things build before pushing it uh -huh. on to... I thought it was possible uh, to add the file, and uh, I did it just to modifying the redeem and everything. Yeah. Uh, but definitely, I, um, I would do that. Because I'm I'm actually on several <laughs> book clubs, <laughs> so my R is quite uh, full of things, and sometimes I just threw uh, uh, everything away and then uh, load them up again, yeah. just to free up a bit my computer. Uh, so I might I might do that. Try doing that, yes, and to cool. just load a file and uh, um, uh, I want to, I, I will try that, yes. Sweet. Yeah, great. Um, okay. Well, I hope to see you both next week. I'll 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 advertise it a bit wi more widely across Twitter and Alpha Data Science and things like that, and hopefully get a few more people in because I know that there's a lot of interest in learning Gollum and in in, in things. But um, cool, brilliant, cool. lovely to speak to you all, um, and I'm I'm very pleased that we've got a, a book club starting up again. That's brilliant. Great. Great. Thank you. I'll see you, awesome. see you next Bye. week. Bye. Thanks, Russ. Thanks, Frederica. Bye.